Reformed Church. So this may be the last, for now, part of the Wash My Feet series. The reason being, there, there would actually be another part or two that I would do, except for the fact that um, I'm going to do those parts in the temple series, because um, there's a portion of the temple where there's actually a bowl of water by the feet of the temple. Um, and we'll get into all of that. It's going to be a pretty long series. That it's called uh, We the Temple. I haven't obviously taught it yet, but if you're listening to this in the future, um, it's probably already posted. And, um, and so the parts that I would have done um, in a Wash My Feet series are about the temple. So rather than sort of double up for those that are listening you know, here live, um, I'm just going to leave that off for the temple series, and we'll, I'll just include those um, in this series category um, on our website, you know, for people to listen to later. So there's definitely more uh, substantiation, I guess is my point, to the concept of the washing of the feet being, um, for instance, the one yoke that Jesus has given us. Uh, some really cool stuff with the temple there. Um, and more substantiation just about washing the feet really is, about renewing our mind. And further substantiation about a point that I want to make tonight, and uh, I'm sure the focus will be tonight, um, I'm going to give you some sort of plain verses tonight for a particular uh, point about washing of the feet, but the temple actually really makes it pretty well. So again, and th- that'll be, um, for us listening right now, that'll be you know, in, in, in a few weeks from now. Um, but anyhow, so, so like, as I said, we're, we're going to continue tonight um, with the washing of the feet series, and you know, I won't go over everything that we've, we've been through, but to put it very plainly, our feet being washed is our mind being renewed, right? That's the point we've been making. Feet in the Bible can refer to our mind um, in some way. I don't know the exact definition of the word feet. I tend to believe that the word feet doesn't mean, like its definition isn't mind, which is why I haven't put that, for instance, like on the glossary or anything like that. But um, I, I tend to believe the word feet means something and therefore can imply your mind based off what it means. That's just an opinion right now, but it definitely can refer to your mind. Like that, that is beyond the shadow of any doubt. Um, in the context, of like just because, for instance, uh, like the word wine. We've gone over the word wine before, right? The word wine means to, um, to something that makes you forget, right? But it can be used in context of rest, for instance. Um, so it can be used, depending on the context, um, in different ways. And you can get that on our glossary, reformchurch.com slash glossary. Um, you, can, you can look at symbolic words. And... Feet being one of those symbolic words, I kind of have a vibe that it's probably more like the word wine, where it has a certain definition and then therefore can imply something else. And in this case, at the very least, it does mean our mind. That's why in Ephesians chapter 6, it says that our feet can be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And we're actually going to go through a different point with that verse tonight as well. But so all that said, Jesus washing his disciples' feet is a picture of how Jesus renews our mind. It's his teaching that renews our mind really, really beautiful thing that we taught like two services ago um, about how his teaching is what renews our mind. A lot of times we take on the burden of actually changing our thoughts and making our thoughts right, while um, the only yoke and the only service that Jesus has given us, uh, I think it's Matthew chapter 10 or Matthew chapter 11. You could throw that up there behind me. But Jesus said, take my yoke upon upon you, learn from me. And you see, our only yoke, our only service to God, at least uh, uh, our task is to learn from him. That means the learning, our learning comes from him. We're listening to him, and our learning is coming from him. And that's why, when, in, in the case of the washing of the feet, that's why Jesus is washing his disciples' feet, and they're not washing their own feet. It's a promise that we have to hold on to to understand that the Lord is able to renew our mind. And if you do seek him, now you do have to pay attention to him and give him your time. Pastor Zay was talking about a little bit about that pre-service. You need to give attention to him and give him your time, rather than, you know, because if you go around hearing everything else in this world, and, you know, not giving time to hear Jesus, um, he's not going to be able to renew your mind that way. It is our decision. Just, you know, if you want to renew your mind faster, or you really want more from the knowledge of Jesus, you, you control that gauge, right? Um, it's like a car, you know, you can be in first gear or second gear. Obviously, today, you know, they're automatic, but um, you, you control the gear. Um, the Lord will take you where you need to go, but you can control how fast he goes, um, that, is, the, that ball isn't completely in your court. That's why, you know, I said recently at the end of the age, someone can't say, just because it is Jesus that washes our feet, you can't say like, oh, Jesus, you know, I didn't believe you because you didn't teach me, you know, or, or you didn't give me opportunity enough. The Bible says that even people that haven't heard the gospel yet are without excuse for not seeking him. Just by creation, people have enough knowledge that there is a God out there, 
um, or that you know, they may not call him God. This, it's funny, there's a lot of evolutionists that actually will, will say, you know, uh, oh, I, you know, I don't believe that whole Romans 1 thing, because Romans 1 basically says that everybody intuitively knows just by looking at creation that there is a God. And they say, well, I don't believe that, you know, but, you know, uh, I believe that everything came from a single cell organism and all this stuff. And you say, well, how did the single cell organism get here? And you say, well, you know, maybe or probably uh, some kind of alien life out there, you know, put, put life here on earth. But it's funny, like, you just said that you believed in God, <laughs> right? God is an alien. Like, it, it, you don't understand that. I'm not saying he's a little green man. I'm saying he's an alien, though. Like, and he put life on here. He didn't do it with a single cell organism. Uh, he did it in six days and created man, you know, from the dust of the ground. But, uh, but that being said, it, it is funny how we'll call it different things. An evolutionist will say, I even heard an evolutionist say one time, you know, he said, uh, um, oh, maybe some alien life, you know, put life here, you know, of some Darwinian uh, origin or something like that. But they won't say God. But you're like, well, someone outside this earth, putting life here. You're, you may not know how he put life here, but you're acknowledging that you believe that there was some creative force going on, or there is some kind of life that put life here. So anyway, all that said, people don't have excuse to, to not seek God. Everybody can be seeking him, uh, at the very least from creation. And if we want our minds renewed, we get to control that. We are fully in control of that. If, if we weren't in control of that, Jesus would not put that yoke on you to learn from him. Right, that, that's, that ball's in our court, and that's, that's actually what gives you control indirectly over your life. If you don't like the way your life is going, if you don't like, you know, um, whatever, it could be, you don't like where you are financially, you don't like where you are bodily, you don't like your attitude, you don't like how you react to circumstances, you don't like anything in your life, you can control that actually indirectly. Not directly, obviously, because it's the Lord that changes and transforms us, but because it's the Lord that transforms us, and that transformation is based on the renewal of our mind, and the renewal of our mind is based on us listening to Jesus, and we get to choose whether we listen to Jesus or not, there's a domino effect to the transformation that, therefore, you are in control of that. If you want to get better, you can control you getting better. You can choose life. You can choose to get better. And then you have to do that in your mind. When Jesus says, I've given you these things, and if you want to be wealthy for a purpose, if you want to use wealth for the kingdom of God, you can choose to be wealthy for a purpose. You can choose to be wealthy to promote the kingdom of God and to be able to be generous and to be able to pro pro uh, promote the gospel um, and to be the one in this, because also wealth obviously gives you influence in this world. You can choose that. Uh, there are promises in the Bible, but because we get to choose how much we listen to Jesus, and that choice of how much we listen to Jesus controls how much he's able to renew our mind. And how much he's able to renew our mind controls how much we are transformed. So indirectly, you get to choose life or death, indirectly. You get, because you get to choose who you listen to, wisdom or folly. If you read uh, Proverbs chapter 8, you get to choose wisdom or folly, and therefore wisdom or folly determines your outcome in life. Your life right now can be controlled by who you listen to. Your, your physical, tangible life, what you go through. I'm not saying all these things, oh, if, you, if you're sick or whatever, it's your fault. You could, you, know, you could be growing in the knowledge of the Lord and still experience a problem, but that just means you need a continuance in your knowledge, and then you'll see that rectified externally. So it's, it, it's not an evidence that you're doing something wrong because you don't feel good, or because you could actually be growing your knowledge, but you could be pedal to the metal seeking God, and then, you know, not feel good or something, and that's not because you're doing something wrong. That's just due to the lack of knowledge you have left to learn in your right doing, in your well doing. So th there's that as well. But anyhow, to get kind of onto my point here, um, because we get to control how much we listen to Jesus, that therefore gauges how much He's able to to wash our feet. Um, it's it's very predictable. Um, when someone knows the Lord, it's very predictable. It's not because there's a spe such such thing as a special anointing. That's not why certain people know the Lord more than others or anything like that. Every single Christian has been given the, the mind of Christ. Every single Christian has. And if you want to get to know the Lord more, even in particular, you can get to know the Lord more. And you know what? Until the day the verse is invalid that um, those who seek find, um, what I'm saying is, still holds true, that you can get to know God more if you desire to get to know God more. Because if you do seek him, you will find. All who seek, find. Um, and therefore, if you want to get to know God more, you have to give him your time, and you just start meditating on the things that you believe he's putting on your, on your heart. Um, again, get into the Bible, all the things we've been through in the past. Get all the help you can get as well. But um, 
we definitely do get to control that, though, and you can get to know God more. And um, there's private time that you can devote to the Lord, but it's also just really meditating during, during your day as well, right? Just meditating day and night. Um, last week in particular, um, I had brought you to, and I'll read it to you again, Luke 6.39. Luke 6.39 is, is where Jesus is uh, uh, talking about um, the speck in the one person's eye and the plank in the other person's eye. This is the New King James Version. And um, that's always used to just, it, it, you know, uh, to talk about, like, don't judge someone else's flaws when you have bigger flaws yourself. Like, look in the mirror. That's sort of what people, uh, uh, what people say. And if, if someone ever tells you, to, you know, you know uh, to look in the mirror or something like that or self-examine, you, uh, you know how to do that anyway at this church, right? You just look at Jesus. So it's a pr- pretty good sight whenever we look in the mirror, right? Um, so I got no problem looking in the mirror. It's just not a physical mirror and not the mirror that people are talking about. But anyhow, when, when people talk about, you know, you can't, you know, try to take the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a plank in your own eye, what we actually went over last week is just the fact that um, that's not talking about imperfections in one another in, that, in the sense that we think about it or just sin in general. That's talking about unbelief or blockages in our mind. That's why it says that, that there can be a speck in someone's eye. Your eye is the word for your understanding in Ephesians 1, it says. So when there's a speck in your eye, or that word really means a straw or a twig, like a small fortification, you could say, in someone's eye, that what the Bible is actually saying there is that you, we cannot, and, and, and in particular the people that he was talking to at the time were people that didn't even believe in him is really who he's referring to, but nobody can help someone else see better and take the fortification out of someone else's mind and take unbelief out of someone else's mind unless you first have your eyes uh, cleanse unless you first have all the fortifications or certain fortifications taken down in your mind so that you can see clear enough to then take down the fortifications in someone else's mind. That's actually what it's talking about. It's actually talking about seeing clearly and helping one another see clearly. And if you don't see clearly for yourself, if you don't know the gospel for yourself, you can't help anyone else see clearly either. It's important that we invest our own time into getting to know the Lord for ourselves, because the better you know the Lord for yourself, the more effectual you're going to be able to be in the minds of other people. That's actually what it's talking about, believe it or not. Uh, Luke 6.39 says he spoke a parable and says, Can the blind lead the blind? Will they uh, not both fall into the ditch? I'm not going to go over that right now. Let's just go to verse 41 for the sake of time. It says, And why do you look at the speck, that means the straw or the twig, in your brother's eye? In your brother's eye. That's talking about your brother's mind. Don't look at the speck meaning like a small fortification, a straw or a twig. Because remember last week we all said fortification means unbelief, right? Wrong imaginations from 2 Corinthians 10. So he says, why do you look at the straw or the twig in your brother's eye, in your brother's mind, but you don't perceive the plank, the larger fortification, in your own eye, in your own mind? It's, or how, how can you say to your brother, brother, let me remove the speck or that straw or that twig that's in your eye when you yourself do not see that there is a plank it says, that is in your own eye? In your own mind. Hypocrite, first remove the plank from your own eye, from your own mind. Remove the unbelief from your own mind. Remove the wrong thinking from your own mind, from your own eye, as he says here. And then what? When you remove the plank from your eye, what does it say happens? Then you will see clearly. So this is not just about imperfections or something like that. Because when this plank, if the plank was just a sin of some kind, like just any kind of sin, why would he say that when the plank is removed, now you see clearly? It doesn't make sense, right? If it's just some kind of sin, it's like, oh, I can't say, I can't correct lust in somebody else if I have lust myself. If it were that, then why would, if the plank was lust, for instance, right, just some kind of sin, if I remove the lust from my own life or from my own heart, why would that make me see clearly, right? It doesn't really make any sense when you're talking about sin in general. But as we learned last week, again, at the end of the message last week, the plank or the speck, these are fortifications. Uh, the word plank here even means a support beam, right, which is interesting. Um, and so these are like sort of building terms, right? Like small twig versus a support beam, a larger fortification. And he's just saying that you, you need to remove unbelief from your mind before you're able to teach other people. You won't be able to see clearly for yourself, let alone, I mean, that's why he started this out saying, can the blind lead the blind? In other words, if you're so blind because you've got fortifications and wrong thinking and wrong doctrine and wrong churchy stuff left over in your head, you can't teach someone else the truth if you yourself don't know the truth. As I stated last week as well, which I'm all, still not going to go over this, um, this doesn't extend to healing, so don't ever tell someone, 
well, like, you can't pray for someone else to be healed if you're not healed yourself. It doesn't work there, and there are reasons for that. If you want to note, jot, jot a note to yourself, and we'll talk after service, and I'll explain to you why that's not the case. Um, but it, it doesn't translate there. But it is true, though, that if you don't know the truth for yourself, you can't share that truth with someone else. If you don't see the truth for yourself, you can't make someone else see clearly. And particularly in this context, he's talking about someone who really can't see clearly, like at all, plank, big fortifications in their mind, big wrong doctrines and wrong imaginations in their mind, who are trying to say, oh, I'm going to be a leader and a teacher to someone who has wrong things in their mind, but aren't even, the, the, the thoughts in their mind aren't even as wrong as the thoughts that are in their own mind. That's what he means by straw, twig, and, and plank. He's telling the Jews at the time, you think you, you want to be a teacher to, to the Jewish people. These Jewish leaders, he's saying, you want to be a teacher to the Jewish people and lead them in the ways of truth. Meanwhile, you don't even know the truth for yourself. In fact, your mind's further from the truth than their mind is. They have things that are wrong in their mind for certain, but you don't, you don't like, you're more oblivious to who I am, Jesus telling them, than even they are. They're closer to the kingdom and closer to receiving it than even you are, and yet you're, you profess to be their teacher, and that's why he says, can the blind lead the blind? But won't they both fall into a ditch, which we went over last week? So, with all this said, what would be the best thing? Let, let's assume that he's not even talking, right, about uh, planks and, uh, and specks. Because he's sort of, by that saying, that one has more unbelief in their mind than even the other one does, and the one with more unbelief in their mind is trying to so-called teach the one with less unbelief, right? But let's just even put it on equal playing fields. Let's just say both people have planks in their eyes, right? Both people have the same amount of unbelief or fortification built up in their heart. And just so you know, church is a big culprit. I'm not saying all churches by far, okay? But a lot of churches are the culprit for these planks in people's eyes. For the fortifications that have actually been raised up by religious teaching about Jesus and how we're supposed to approach Jesus, a lot of it has been, has been done by the church. And some people also that profess to be the church, which are not the church. Um, but never be quick to, to call someone a false prophet just because they teach something wrong, Okay. A lot of people I don't agree with, churches I know about, that even don't talk about Jesus very much, but I don't believe they're false prophets just because they don't teach stuff as accurately as, as, you know, as they should. Um, but, but that aside, um, let's just assume that both people in this sort of story both have planks in their eyes. What's the best thing that person one can do for person two um, if they've got a plank in their eye? Well, seeing as they can't, listen to this, seeing as they can't teach person two any truth unless they as person one see for themselves, you hear that? Seeing as they can't make, as Jesus just said, you can't help person two with their unbelief unless you see the truth for yourself. What's the best thing then that person one can do for person two? See the truth for themselves. We want to throw people very quickly into leadership positions. We want to throw qu people very quickly out on the streets in evangelical, with different evangelical type tasks. Um, and a lot of these people that we're throwing in leadership positions today in the church haven't been proven, and they don't even know the truth for themselves. But we just assume that because Jesus said, go into every nation and preach the gospel, that that automatically simply means that pretty much anybody, as long as you say that you believe in Jesus, we're going to put you behind a pulpit, we're going to allow you to do that, or we're going to allow you to teach in a classroom, or we're going to throw you out in some kind of missionary uh, role or whatever it is, just because you believe in Jesus. But, you, but a lot of the people that we're putting behind pulpits and a lot of people that we're sending off, so, 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 to, so to speak, um, in missionary roles and different ministry-type leadership roles, a lot of those people are blind. A lot of them don't see clearly for themselves. And so rather than telling them, hey, the best thing that you can do sitting in your chair right now is just to learn Jesus for yourself, and that'll automatically make you an effectual minister. Rather than just do that, which really would be what Jesus is saying here, that the best thing person one can do for person two is actually just to learn Jesus for yourself. Why? When you learn Jesus for yourself, you're going to be... You're going to be able to see clearly enough. Look at what it says in that last verse. Hypocrite, first remove the plank. That means first remove the unbelief in your... Now, he is talking about hypocrites here. Uh, but you, can you don't have to take this as far as like a hypocritical thing. You can even take this uh, as a principle even for believers, right? That just don't see something about Jesus. Um, he says, first remove the plank from your own eye, from your own mind. Then you will see clearly to remove the speck that is in your brother's eye. What is he saying? That the best thing you can do to remove the speck in your brother's eye is to remove what is in your eye first. Then you will see clearly to preach to other people. Then you will see clearly automatically whether you have a leadership role or not. So many people need, they just need uh, the, the, the validation of a ministry role. 
A lot of people that get excited about Jesus, the first thing they say is they either want to go to Bible college or they want a ministry role within the church. And you know, you know why both of them are wrong? Because a lot of that, a lot of it is just seeking validation to, to feel that you're legitimized in your knowledge of Jesus. I, there's not a single Bible school right now, right now, that I would recommend anyone except to go to Reform U, right? Reformchurch.com slash reform and the letter U, all right? That's the only thing I would recommend anyone. And that's a that's better Bible school than you're going to hear anywhere. I've never, ever heard something better uh, to recommend than to just go on Reform U um, and just listen through from the top all the way to the bottom, and you're going to get a better training, hear things that you've never heard in your life before. But the reason a lot of times why we will even push that aside, which is free to you, at least right now, all right? And maybe at some point, you know, it'll take the form of a more official thing or something like that. But uh, it, it's free to use, better information, but guess what? But I, I don't have, I don't have a diploma. I won't have something to hang up on my wall. Uh, I don't have a title, though, in the church. And we, we, we sometimes seek validation from a degree, or we seek validation from these various different things, or because I've been put in a role, and now I'm a minister. Where actually, what makes you a good minister and an effectual minister is you removing the fortresses from your own eye. Obviously, we know what I'm saying is that Jesus does it, but we have to allow him to do it. Obviously, that, I'm not contradicting everything I've, I've said. But that's how you remove fortresses from your own eye. You let Jesus wash your feet. You let Jesus renew your mind. The best thing you can do for person two, if you want to minister to them, is keep learning Jesus for yourself. Go gung-ho on the word of God. Get the word of God from the Bible, from church. Get all the help you can get surrounding you. Hang out with the right people that are going to influence you. And you say, well, you know what? You know, sometimes I hang out with people that, you know, don't believe and uh, they're not really interested in hearing the Lord, but I kind of hang out. I persist in hanging out with them anyway. But what's the big deal? You know, they don't really, you know, care that I believe in Jesus. They're not like trying to convince me otherwise. The problem is because what ends up happening is the things they do and say get normalized in your mind, whether you realize that or not. You know, I've seen people, I mean, a lot of people before, that even when they leave this church, they'll speak one way while they're coming to this church, and then when they leave the church, you talk to them a year later, they don't even sound like the same person. And a lot of that is because the word of God that they were actually getting was very much reliant on the, the word that they were hearing here. And I'm not saying it should be that way, but it goes to show you that if they would have stayed, they would have been continued encouraged in that word. And I doubt that they even realize that they sound different to me. I doubt they even hear it because you don't realize that it's happening. But when you, when you surround yourself with stuff, media, um, that's the importance of listening to music that you agree with. Do you, you say, well, what music should I listen to? Should I listen to secular music or Christian music? Or, you know, what, 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 listen to music you agree with. What kind of movies should I li listen to? movies that you agree with, at least the, 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 that they're not contradicting the knowledge of Jesus, right? That, that's what you should do. That's the stuff that you should seek out. And just so you know, movies that you agree with doesn't mean Christian movies because I, <laughs> I also haven't, I never met a Christian movie that I liked. So <laughs> just, just to throw that out there as well. But, um, and I'm, I mean, I'm actually serious about that. <laughs> um, but, but anyhow, it's important, though, to seek the word of God for yourself and not allow, like Pastor Lee was talking about pre-service, to guard your heart, not allow external factors to normalize things in their way of doing, in their way of living. Uh, but you want to normalize the things of God. You want to normalize who you are in Christ. And you receiving that word for yourself is the best thing you can ever do for anyone else because you can't remove what's in their eye unless you first get removed what's in your eye. You will not be able to see clearly to remove what's in their eye. And you know what? Um, when you, we even said last week, right? Um, I believe, therefore I spoke. I believe, therefore I spoke. If you believe, you will speak. Even from a carnal principle perspective, even whether that's unbelief or belief in Christ, what you believe, you will speak. If your confession is rarely just sort of in a relaxed state, your confession sort of just drifts to anything but Jesus, it's because the Lord is not abundantly on your mind. Okay? When, when confession, when it's hard for you to converse about Jesus, but it's not hard for you to converse about pretty much anything else, it's because you're a Jesus not abundantly in your heart. It's an indication. It's a red flag because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks. I'm not saying Jesus is not in your heart. I'm saying that it's not what's in your heart that your mouth speaks. It's what's abundantly in your heart that your mouth speaks. And what, the thing that you talk about all the time are the thing that's always, that's always on your mind. That's most on your mind. That's the indication. If your conversation easily drifts into Christ, 
It's because the Lord is abundantly on your mind. When your conversation more easily drifts into anything else but Jesus, it's because those things are abundantly in your heart. You're focusing on those things. What your eye focuses on is what your mouth speaks. That's why the Bible will many times say that we receive by our confession. Not because it's literally coming from your confession, but because you cannot claim that you believe something in a full assurance way without it constantly coming out of your mouth. That's actually, confession happens just before you're receiving. And listen, you can't fake it, so it's not worth just like trying to change your words. Jesus said, told us to not change our words. He said, either make the tree good and its fruit good, or the tree bad and its fruit bad. The tree is your mind, the fruit is actually your words there, if you actually look at it closely. Uh, Jesus said this throughout the Gospels. What does that mean? Make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. That means if the fruit is bad, don't change the fruit. The fruit is your words. The fruit is your words. If the fruit's bad and you notice the fruit's bad, it's nothing wrong with it. If you notice, hey, you know what? I don't like talking about, I don't like the ease with which I talk about culture and the, the difficulty with which I talk about the Lord. I, I don't like that sort of dichotomy there. If you don't like that, don't change your words. If the fruit is bad and you don't like the fruit, change the tree. That's your mind. He said, either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. In other words, Jesus said, don't touch the fruit. Because if you, changed, if you tried to change your confession, it would be fake. And the same thing would be in your heart. Because you can manipulate your confession. That's, how, that's where lies come from, right? A lie means it's not really in my mind, but I'm saying it anyway. And you say, well, how, doesn't that contradict that out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks? If, if I'm saying right now that a lie is speaking something that's not in your heart, because the principle is this, and I'll get off this point right now, but the principle is this, that not everything that you say is abundantly in your heart. That's where lies come from. But everything that's abundantly in, abundantly in your heart, your mouth will speak. Right? So uh, you can meditate on that for a little bit, if, if that was that confusing at all, but that's the way that it is, right? Um, so with all that said, it's, it's us just focusing on the Word of God for ourselves that's going to cause us to speak to other people. The word, you, you would not be able to keep the word of God in when it's abundantly in your heart. There were even people, funny enough, that Jesus, like I believe it was the, uh, the demoniac, which means like demon-possessed person, it, uh, that Jesus cast a demon out of this man, I believe it was him, and then told him, basically because Jesus was sort of saying that his time hadn't come for certain things yet, so he told the man not to tell anyone about what had happened, about how Jesus had healed him and uh, and, and cast this demon out, and the man just went out and spread it everywhere. So the word went everywhere. And it's because, that, and even, that's just from a carnal sense. That wasn't even like the Holy Spirit controlling his words, which is really what we want. Even from a carnal sense, when you get a glimpse of who Jesus is and it becomes abundantly in your heart, your mouth speaks automatically. Automatically. That's why Jesus said, don't change the fruit. Don't change your words. If you believe, therefore you will speak. But if you're not speaking it, if you're not speaking it, if you notice there's not ease with which you speak the word of God, or you just talk about things I'm not saying you can't talk about things, right? We do things in our life. But you'll notice that even the things you speak about, become, they revolve around Jesus now. You, you, you talk about work, and all of a sudden you're talking about the Lord, or, the, your, or rather your work in context of the Lord. You'll notice it. You talk about whatever. You'll be talking about anything, what you do for recreation, and you're going to talk about it in context with the Lord. Uh, man, I, I'm not going to give you specific examples, but there's just like, it, it's just, there's, there's, uh, Something about the Lord to talk about in regards to everything. And you'll just kind of notice it drifts that way pretty easily. Um, and you know what? None of us here uh, are, are, have, you know, have learned fully or have arrived in our heart to understand all the ways in which we have already arrived in our spirit. But that's what we're pressing toward, though. That's what we're pressing to understand more, is to understand and explore all the depths of who we are in Christ on the inside of us. That's what we're exploring. So if you don't like your confession... Seeing as your confession is the evidence, the ease with which you speak things is an is a indication of your heart. Change your heart then. Get Jesus renewing your mind, okay? Because when you believe, you'll automatically speak. That's why the best thing you can do is get your mind renewed from Jesus. And it'll automatically affect other people. You know, I've, I've had, I, I, mean, I hope this is taken correctly too. I, I, I don't mean it to sound sort of silly here. Um, but like I've, he, I've had people before tell me like, you know, uh, someone will come up and tell me you're Pastor Jose, like, you know, they were blessed by a message or something like that, right? And I've had people tell me that before, and, you know, it's, it's, it's almost sounded weird to me before, because it was like, 
I, I just, I sort of see myself like I'm just a person that just learns from, like I, I just see myself sort of in my apartment and just learning from Jesus and like that's, that's where my concern is at. So to see sort of almost unintentionally somebody else getting blessed by something that I said, like, that, like I wasn't even trying to do that. If that makes sense. It's not that I, 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 I don't know that all of us as believers are used by God to bless other people, right? But when you, I guess when your focus gets so wrapped up in like, I'm just learning, I'm just learning, I'm just learning, I'm getting it, I'm putting it in my mind, right? It, it, when it blesses somebody else, you're like, oh, oh, it blessed somebody else. Like it, 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 you were just getting blessed by it personally so much that you were like, oh yeah, that, that's true. Like this, this carries on to other people. It blesses other people when I get my mind focused on Jesus. It became so per, it's become so personal and really just, I've always prayed to the Lord too. I actually used to be afraid of this when I was younger. And I would always ask the Lord, Lord, I pray that I never get so caught up in like ministry. I just want it to be me and you and me learning from you. Because a lot of times you can even in preparing for messages, you end up preparing for a message instead of just spending time with Jesus. Like, Lord, what do you want to, what do you want to tell me? And even with the series that I've been going through, a lot of times there's a tendency to just look at what's next on the agenda sort of. And a lot of times I just push it aside and I'm like, you know, if I went this whole night, Lord, and I don't even look at that because you're speaking something else to me, I'd rather have one word from you than a dozen words that I was speaking myself just because I felt like going in a certain direction. It's always about getting what the Lord is speaking to you. That's why Jesus says one thing is needful. And Mary had found the good part. That's Luke chapter 10. Mary had found the good part, and that's just listening to his word. Being an effectual minister isn't more than that, what you see there listening to the word of God. That makes you an effectual minister, and you'll kind of experience the same thing then too, you know, if you haven't already. That just like, when other people are blessed by something you say, you're like, you, you, it, you, you were so, you had your nose to the grind, so, so to speak, to when you looked up and said, oh, someone else was blessed by that, but I was just learning Jesus because I have to learn from Jesus, whether you even existed or not, whether the whole world around me existed or not, I have to learn Jesus. And like, I was doing it because I have to. And because I know the Lord's called me to do that, and I know he has my best interest in heart because he wants everything for me. So I have to. I mean, like, it, it, I think Paul even said, like, woe is me, you know, if, if I don't pursue the gospel. And it's like, so you, 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 you get it for yourself. But it's not selfish because when you get the word of God for yourself, that's the best thing you can do for person two. On one hand, because you, you can't teach them the truth unless you see clearly. And the more clearly you see, the, 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 the more it just comes out of your mouth effortlessly by the Holy Spirit, controlling your words to actually bless other people, not to mention all the fruit that it bears in your life and miracles to confirm the word of God that you're preaching to other people. But if you want to be an effectual minister of the gospel, just get the word of God for yourself. Just get the word of God for yourself. It's not harder than that. One thing is needful does not become two things are needful when you've got other people to preach to. And don't get me wrong, people need preaching. Need it. Like really need it. And it's not going to happen without you. You understand that? People are not going to hear by osmosis. People hear because you preach to them. So it might sound like a radical statement for me to say that and then say, just get the knowledge of Jesus for yourself. Because they need the preaching, and they won't hear without a preacher. You. Now, I'm not talking about me or Pastor Jose. I'm talking about you. They won't hear without you telling them. So how can I then say it's just about you getting the knowledge of Jesus for yourself? Because that's how... Preaching to other people happens. That's how you become prepared and equipped to see clearly enough to take whatever is in your brother's eye out. That's, 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 that's how that happens. In fact, the gospel itself, let's go to Ephesians 6.15. When you get your feet washed, there's something very, there's an interesting thing here. I'm going to have to speed this up. There's a very, very interesting point here in regards to the washing of the feet. Jesus said, if I, your Lord, if you remember this from John 13, if I, your Lord, and your teacher wash your feet, he said, if I then wash your feet, then you ought to wash one another's feet. You see that, that order? You can't wash someone else's feet if your feet aren't washed. So what's the best thing you can do to get, everybody, to get this world of people full of unbelief to get their feet washed? Have your Lord and your teacher wash your feet. That's the best thing you can do. And listen, you know, it's the, it's the people, the people that are legitimate preachers of the gospel don't need a title. You don't need a title. 
Being a minister has nothing to do with a title. Actually, the fact that you'd want a title means you're not ready for a title. Genuinely. Um, I mean, I remember even talking to the teens upstairs. And actually, you know what? If I was in the nursery right now, I couldn't care less. So some people say, oh, I don't want to teach the nursery kids. They don't even understand what I'm saying. I'm like, I'm, I'm pursuing Jesus, and I'm getting the knowledge of Jesus for myself, and I don't care what title I have. That doesn't stop me from ministering to people. Because I have a, even if you're an usher or a greeter and you don't have a direct ministry like, like teaching role, that doesn't stop you from ministering to people. I mean, obviously you have a job to do when you're here. But you can minister to whoever you want. You can speak to whoever you want. And the person that just wants to get to know Jesus and is just going to let that kind of like leak out all over the place, you know, and, and on whoever sort of uh, you're talking to, maybe that person is ready at some point in time for a leadership role, but... Um, it's the people that are just content getting to know Jesus for themselves and that are just content ministering to people. Those are actually the people that you want to give a ministry role anyway. But uh, anyway, with all that said, Ephesians 6.15, it says, and your feet shod. What does your feet shod mean? The word shod, I, I probably should have looked the word up, but I, I imagine the word shod is it, it's talking about sort of like, um, like to cover your feet, to clothe your feet. It says, your feet shod. What does that mean? That means getting your, your own mind renewed, right? Your own feet washed. And what happens when your feet are, whose feet? Their feet? No, your feet. When your feet are shod with the gospel, what does it call that? Preparation. Do you see that? When your feet get the gospel, when your mind gets the gospel, he says that's the preparation of the gospel of peace. Now, it makes sense that the Bible would say you put the gospel on your feet, you know, considering everything we've spoken about up until this point. But why call it preparation? Because even without you knowing it, I mean, we should know these things, but even if you didn't know it, when you are getting your feet washed by Jesus, even without you knowing it, you're being prepared to tell someone else about it. Because it's just going to happen by the Holy Spirit when you get your feet washed. You see that? When your feet are shod, you're being prepared. For what? That's talking about being prepared to tell someone else. This is why in Romans 10, 15, it says um, specifically, how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel of peace. Because, notice, he, he's talking about people that preach the gospel. And what does it say, what characteristic does he say about, that is, that is uh, all-encompassing? For everyone that preaches the gospel of peace, what does it say? They have beautiful feet. They have beautiful feet. That's why they're preachers. Because they took time to get their feet washed. Anyone that legitimately preaches the gospel, I'm not talking about in a leadership role, you're not more legitimately preaching a gospel because you have a teaching role. Um, neither should those things be sort of coveted after, right? Uh, teaching roles. Just, you know, uh, if I weren't teaching you right now, I'm going to be talking about Jesus anyway. <laughs> I might as well do it in, in here if someone gives me the opportunity, and I'm very grateful that Pastor Zayden and Ms. Kim give me an opportunity to teach at this church, but if it wasn't here, it'd be somewhere else. I don't mean another church. I'd be coming to this church. It'd be somewhere else though, on the street. It'd be with family. It'd be with friends. It'd be whatever it may be. Because no one's going to stop you speaking the gospel when you know the gospel. But notice how it says that all those who preach the gospel of peace have beautiful feet. Because the way that we're able to teach the gospel of peace, the way that we're able to minister to one another, is by getting our own feet washed. They had to get beautiful feet first before they could preach the gospel. See that? They've already got beautiful feet, and that's why they're preaching. That's why they're able to preach. It's because they've got the beautiful feet first. So if you want to be an effectual minister of the gospel, what do you do? Well, get the beautiful feet. Get that characteristic of these preachers. It's that characteristic of these preachers here in Romans 10, 15, also in Isaiah 52, 7. Well, you don't have to go there. Isaiah 52, 7 says the same thing. But how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the uh, gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. If you want to preach glad tidings of good things, if you want to preach the gospel of peace, if you want to be an effective minister of the gospel then copy and imitate the characteristic of those who preach, which is what? Beautiful feet. Their beautiful feet. Their beautiful feet. You have to get your feet, be feet uh, beautified and renewed with the knowledge of Jesus. Once your feet are renewed, ministry becomes an automatic thing. Automatic. Uh, I'm going to also teach something about the temple that's really, really cool. I'll give you a little bit of a taste right now. The temple looks like a woman lying on her back, right? I'll show you, show you all of that. We got some really cool pictures and stuff to show you as well. 
like a woman lying on her back, there happens to be a bowl of water by the temple's feet, which, right, that's a cool confirmation to what we've been saying. It's water. It's by her feet. A lot of cool things with that. But guess what? There are also oxen underneath that bowl of water that are carrying that bowl of water. Um, the quick tease of that would be that it's the, the light yoke. Learn from me. But anyway, the oxen are facing north, south, east, and west as if going out into every nation to preach the gospel. Because as the temple's resting and getting her feet washed, it's preparation. It's preparation. That is preparation. You getting it for yourself. The temple getting her feet washed is the preparation to be effective in going out to every nation to preach the gospel. You may not, even like what I was describing before, you may not even realize when what you were saying minister to somebody else. Because you could just be talking. It doesn't even matter where it is. You don't even have to realize that, and you don't need that pat on the back. You've got the biggest pat on the back from Jesus, and he respects you so much. Respects you, not just loves you. Respects you, honors you, and reveres you in a godly sense for the decision you made to obey his one commandment. God respects you already. You are respectable before God. You know, when I ever teach a message and it's not up to my satisfaction and I didn't hit the points I wanted to hit or I said something the wrong way or whatever it is, you know what? I go home, you know what I remember? It's the recurring thing that I remember. Thank you so much, Father, that you respect me. Because at the time, what I may be feeling is a lack of dignity. I don't just want to hear that God loves me because I don't need love at that point in time to hear. I need, my, my, my issue would be a lack of dignity. And I go home and realize that Father, I thank you that you honor everyone that serves Jesus. You honor him. And I have the praise of God. Therefore, I don't need the praise of men. I thank you for the respect that dignifies me, Lord. I've been dignified, and you respect my decision to obey you. And every Christian is obedient. Otherwise, you wouldn't be a Christian. God respects you. He respects you. He honors you for your decision and also simply for who you are in Christ. Not of your own making, obviously, but by the grace of God through Jesus. But, uh, the respect, so we don't need a pat on the back from somebody else, but you'll realize that you end up blessing people and ministering to people. Because when you get your feet washed, it automatically prepares you and equips you for that work of the ministry. Automatically. You are automatically become in preparation mode when you're just receiving it for your feet. And if I then, if I then wash your feet, you ought to wash one another's feet. Because one leads to the, to the other. You need to be able to see clearly for yourself to be able to remove the speck from your brother's eye. You'd have feet washed, beautiful feet first, before you can preach to other people. Just get it for yourself. Best thing you can do for everybody. The ways in which God can use you for healings, for miracles, not to mention what we're talking about in context, the, the preaching of the gospel, even just to your family, the encouragement you can be in your family as a leader. Because you know what? A man is the head of his household. That does not mean that a woman needs to go along with every single thing a man says because a man is not the dictator of his household and he doesn't have control over, over his wife and the decisions that she makes, but he is the head of his household. And when, when a wife submits to her husband as the head of the household, the Bible says to do it without fear. In other words, you're not submitting because you're cowering before your husband. You're submitting for the Lord's sake because you know that it's orderly for there to be a chain of command. Okay. Uh, that's why you submit to people. You do need to submit. Without submission, if you treat with disrespect your elders, for instance, it's, it's out of whack and out of line, and there's going to be disorder there and chaos. There needs to be submission. But even for a wife recognizing that her husband is the head of the household, you don't have to be, and, and what does that mean, just so you know, just for a little clarification, what does that mean, the husband being the head of the household? Uh, the husband needs to submit to his wife in, in decisions being made. The Bible says that husbands need to also submit to their wives, just the way that wives submit to their husbands. But the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, right? But just be, that, that's where I get also that the husband is not the dictator. That means what I say goes no matter what anybody else wants. The husband needs to submit to his wife for decisions because they're partners in that sense. But the way I've heard it described, which does sort of aptly describe it, is that the husband gets the tiebreaker. If there is a, a decision and there's, there cannot be agreement, then the husband would get it because the husband being the head of the household, despite the fact the husband needs to submit to his wife for decision making, that's how it would work, right? Um, but so, so this is not some sort of like male chauvinist sort of thing where men, and also just so you know, men are not the head of every woman. In a workplace, at this church or whatever, I submit to Miss Kim. 
right? Miss Kim is my head. I mean, not to mention the fact that she's also my, my mother, so obviously there's submission that goes in honoring your, your father and mother as well. Um, but, but even if she wasn't, right, I, she is my head in this church. She's, she's head over helps ministry or our, our, our reform team. So it's not that the man is ahead of every woman. It's only in respect to a household, right? And God does that because it needs to be order, right? There can't be chaos where there's sort of uh, decisions can't be made because of conflict, right? Um, but with all that said, um, despite the fact that the man is the head of his household, you, anybody, can be a leader in teaching the gospel. Anybody can take the initiative to say, you know what, I'm going to start encouraging my family and leading my family in the ways of God and what Jesus has done for us. Anybody can stand up and be that kind of leader because you don't even have to be a part of a household to be that kind of leader. You can be that kind of leader anywhere, but you don't have to try to be that kind of leader. Because when you try to be that kind of leader, then you just end up sort of, a, it becomes a I'm the boss kind of mentality rather than just being a leader in the sense that you're going to speak the truth in love and you're going to guide people's minds and shepherd people's, people's minds whether you've been given a title or whether you haven't because you're perfectly content knowing Jesus for yourself, knowing that that's going to overflow in ministry to other people and washing other people's feet automatically. Again, the people that are worth their salt in what they're saying are the people that don't care at all about a title. That's why I love the example. We're actually going to release an article soon called I Want to Start My Own Ministry, and I'd encourage you to read that. I'm, I'm sure many of us, if you're subscribed, uh, do read the articles when they go out. But, um, but I encourage you to read that when it comes out because uh, it just even talks about Stephen. Stephen basically waited tables, and it talks about how the mighty, the miracles and stuff that God was doing through him, and he was preaching the gospel and confounding the Jews, and the Jews couldn't even answer him. That's, his points were, were so on point the Jews couldn't even find an answer to give him, just gnash their teeth at him, and he was the table waiter. That's what he did. That's the title he had. He wasn't an apostle, but if you didn't see his title, you would have assumed he was probably an apostle. But because you don't need a title to preach the gospel, to be an effectual minister, you just get your own feet washed, and you're just going to end up washing other people's feet. Because when you get your feet shod with the gospel, it is preparation. It prepares you. To preach other people. Get your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Because as it's happening to your feet, it's preparing you to wash someone else's. Automatically. I'm going to leave you with this point. Um, I, we, we, we do have uh, a little bit left. But let me just change gears a little bit. N not really much. It's really the same point. But I want to define a term. There's a term in the Bible, um, sending. Um, S-E-N-D-I-N-G. Right? Sending. Um, and the Bible will talk about sending people to preach the gospel. Sending people to preach the gospel. And if you were to say to a pastor, or if God were to tell a pastor to like, oh, I want you to start sending people to preach the gospel. The first notion, probably even by a lot of us, would be, well, okay, I'm going to get up on Sunday. I'm going to start appointing people to different missionary tasks and sending them out to preach the gospel. We're going to start having, and just so you know, all of which are necessary and needed, by the way. Okay, just so you, everyone's very clear on that, okay? There is a necessity for people to be in roles of teaching in the church and be sent out from the church, okay, right? People need to hear the gospel. But, but that's what they would assume would be meant by Jesus saying, I want you to start sending people. But you know what's really funny? Even the term sending people to preach the gospel in the Bible is actually described that the way you do that is just by teaching them the truth. You're sending them when you're teaching them. Because teaching someone, as we just read from Ephesians 6, is preparing them to preach to other people. By the time you put them in a leadership role, that's just the very tail end of sending somebody. Sending is a process. Sending someone to preach the gospel this is probably noteworthy, like if you're taking notes, but sending people is a process of teaching them the gospel for themselves. That's what sending people is. But the Bible defines actually sending people as just getting them the word of God for them. Let me show you, show you that here. Romans 10, 15. Um, we're actually already there. It says, and how shall, watch this, how shall they preach except they be sent? Now, isn't that a little bit of a weird thing? Because... He says, how? Like, almost like it's impossible for someone to preach unless they're sent. And you'd be like, well, I could preach whenever I want. I don't have to be, like, ordained or something to, to, to preach 
uh, in, in order to preach. I don't have to have like a specific task set to me to be able to preach. Why would it say, like, how? How in the world is someone going to preach unless they're sent? You, you, you'd feel like, well, no one has to send me in order for me to preach to somebody else, but actually you do. You do need to be sent in order to preach, and that's why Paul is asking that sort of rhetorical question, how can they preach unless they're sent? Because watch this. How can they preach unless, except they be sent as it is written? Okay, pause. What does he mean by as it is written? He means I'm about to substantiate my previous point, right? So he says his point is people cannot preach unless they're sent. That's his point. Then he says as it is written. So he's about to substantiate why people can't preach unless they're sent first. And then he goes on to say that the verse he quotes from Isaiah 52 that substantiates this is how beautiful are the feet of those that preach the gospel. Think about this. He says, you can't preach unless you're sent. And here's a good verse to prove to you that people can't preach unless they're first sent. Here's the verse that substantiates that. You've got to have beautiful feet before you can preach. We know beautiful feet means mind renewal, right? So let's just say it plainly. You can't preach unless you're sent. Here's the verse that substantiates that. Your mind needs to be renewed before you can preach. He proves his point that you need to be sent before preaching by quoting a verse about mind renewal before preaching. You see that? How can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, you need to get your feet washed before you can ever preach. Sending someone is the process of washing their feet. Sending people is actually the process of just teaching them the truth. That's why he quotes a verse about mind renewal when referring to sending people. That's why he quotes a verse about your mind needing to be renewed of necessity before you can ever preach, because we've been talking about this, right, the whole message tonight and even last message, that you can't preach unless your mind is renewed, right? We know that. That makes sense, right? You need to see clearly for yourself before you can make anyone else see clearly. And that's why Paul says you can't preach unless you're Mind is renewed? No, unless you're sent. Because sending is the process of somebody, even the Lord himself, just directly from the Lord. The Lord, or with the help of somebody else as well, anytime you preach to somebody else, you're also sending them to preach to other people automatically because that's what teaching them does. It's the preparation to teach somebody else. When you teach someone, you get to partake with the Lord, as we've been learning. You get to receive from God personally. You get the knowledge for yourself. But... Without you even knowing sometimes, you're being prepared to teach somebody else. As a minister of the gospel, which every single Christian is. Every single Christian is. Go to John 13, 12. John 13, 12. You know, as I said before, you need to respect your elders. Uh, even, even just an older man or woman, it is uh, correct to respect them. Maybe not even their opinion but to respect the fact that they're older than you. That is respectful. Uh, it's becoming more and more, you know, uh, out of style to, to respect your parents these days and things like that. There's actually even movies we've seen where, um, and the funny thing, I don't even have a dog in the fight here because I'm, obviously I'm not a parent right now, and so I'm speaking this from Scripture. Um, and um, it's becoming out of style to honor your father and mother. And I say that because there's even things going on right now where uh, kids can have uh, change their gender or do different things, and it's actually like thought to be right to not tell the parents. Or, te or kids learning things in school, and it's somehow right to not tell the parents. Like the parents don't have the control. You know, the kids are just as much the right of a teacher to teach as they are the parents to teach. Almost like taking, diminishing the role of a parent by sort of uh, making it almost commonplace as to who gets to teach your kids, right? That's not correct even in the Ten Commandments, right, which are holy and just and good, say to honor your father and mother because a child is accountable to his father and his mother, not to a teacher or anyone else, right? Um, a child is accountable to his father and his mother. So there is a respect. You don't talk to your father and mother the same way you would talk to anyone else, right? Uh, there is respect you have there. Uh, also, there, there is respect that you have toward your leaders, right? So if someone is above you, it, this could be anywhere, if someone is above you, you respect the position, right? And you don't have to. I mean, man, a great example, if you want to read about this, is David and Saul. Probably the best example I can think of. Saul was a cruel man, 
Saul was an ungodly man. He started out knowing the Lord, and then he just went off the deep end, and um, God forsook him because it was the Old Testament uh, at the time that could happen. But um, David respected Saul so much. Actually, the man, there was a man, at the end of Saul's life, Saul was hurt in battle, and Saul asked a man to kill him because he said, you know, I don't want the Philistines to kill me, so you just kill me. And the man said, no, you know, the man was afraid he wouldn't kill Saul, so Saul fell on his own sword. But the man, seeing Saul dead, went to David um, and told David, guess what, I killed Saul, even though he didn't, thinking that David, because Saul had been hunting David for so long, and thought that David would sort of like that, that, oh, I killed your enemy. But because David knew that God had anointed Saul to be king, and because not only was Saul the king, but it was an extra layer of respect because he knew that God made Saul king. Even if Saul went off the deep end, God had still made Saul king. Because of that respect, David killed the man, had the man killed, that said he killed Saul. Obviously, I'm not taking, telling you to, tell, uh, t- to take those measures with disrespect, uh, David actually became king and had the authority to do that. But um, with all that said, you see the respect God, he, he would not, it actually, David's conscience bothered him, which it did not have to. Read our clean conscience articles. David's conscience bothered him just for um, the potential mocking of Saul by taking a piece of his robe off. Uh, because David, there's a, whole, there's a whole story, but Saul was hunting David. And David came in close proximity to Saul and cut off a little piece of his robe to show him later that I did you no harm, even though I could have. And that sort of mockery, like, I had you in my hands, you know, I, I could have killed you, that bothered David's conscience. And, and that's not just you know, a sign of godliness for your conscience to be bothered. But you can see, though, that it came from the respect that he had for Saul, despite the fact that Saul was hunting him, trying to kill him. So when you talk about respecting people, It is not because they're necessarily owed respect because of their works. It is because it is for the Lord's sake, for the sake of order and for the Lord's sake, especially when you know God has appointed someone, there is a respect that you have. But you know what? Even with all that respect, it's not because, even like when we respect people that minister to us, right? Uh, To me, I respect the most people that minister to me the gospel. Because if there's nothing more important than that, and someone has devoted themselves to preaching to me the gospel, I respect that person more than some other person, right? But even despite that respect, you don't respect somebody because you can't preach the gospel the same. You respect them because of what they've instilled in you, and you respect them because of their position. But God has made every single Christian a minister of the gospel. Moses desired to see the day. It's written about, I think, in Exodus, but I could be wrong. Um, Desired to see the day that all God's people would be prophets. He said, "I, I will that God would give his spirit to everyone, that they'd all prophesy, that they'd all be prophets. And the day has come when we have the spirit of prophecy on the inside of us, and everybody has the ability to speak inspired by God, but you cannot do that unless you get your feet washed. And that's all that's necessary. One thing is needful. Look at John 13, 12. It says, so when he had washed their feet, uh, and taken his garments, uh, yeah, when he had washed their feet, Jesus took his garments and sat down again and said, do you know what I have done to you? After he washed their feet. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. And we went over last week, and I'm wrapping up soon. We went over last week why Jesus called teacher and Lord in this context. Because if washing the feet is a, is a symbol of him teaching us, it makes sense that he call himself our teacher and Lord in this context. So he, he says that. So his first title, he tells him, is what? Teacher and Lord. We went over that, that last week. And you say, well, for so I am, especially in this context, right? Washing their feet symbolically. If I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, if, if I then, your Lord and your teacher, have washed your feet, then you ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Once it's done to you, it empowers you actually to wash someone else's feet. Verse 16. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant, and, 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 sorry, before we even read verse 16, was, he introduced himself as their teacher. Makes sense. He's washing their feet. Symbolically, it means he's teaching them. What's the next title he gives himself? But remember, first title, teacher foot washer, mind renewer. What's the next title he gives himself? Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. Jesus also in the role of who? He who sends them. You see that? Paul, before substantiated, used the word sending synonymous with 
having your feet washed, beautified. That's what he called sending people, was just wash their feet. You want to send people to preach the gospel? Remember the example I gave before? If God called a pastor to start sending people to preach the gospel, he just might start appointing everyone to different tasks. But that's the very tail end result of what happens when you're sending somebody. Sending someone is actually just equipping them. Committing these things to faithful men who will also be able to teach other people as well. It's that commitment of the word of God to people. That's what sending them is. When they go and preach, that's just the end of it. Sending someone is teaching them. That's why Jesus washes their feet, which is a symbol of him renewing their mind, renewing their mind, renewing their mind. And then he says, the one who is sent, you, is not greater than he who sent him. He was sending them, symbolically, obviously. I know that he, he, he was just washing their feet, but symbolically, sending them by just them getting their feet washed. You are being sent and prepared. When your feet are shod, you're being prepared. When your feet are being washed, you're being sent. When your feet are being beautified, you're being sent automatically because that is the end result of getting your mind renewed is preaching to other people. If you want to send people to preach the gospel, then just start committing to them the word of God that you know. And the more you commit the word of God to people, the more and more they're being sent. The more and more they're being equipped, the more and more they're being prepared with the gospel that will result in them spreading that to more people. And more people do need to hear the gospel. More people do need to hear the gospel. And if people need to hear the gospel, it's worth them hearing the right gospel. Of course, appointing people to tasks when they're ready for those tasks. But that aside, obviously, you can share at any time the things that you know. And what, it, what makes you effectual in doing so is getting your own feet washed. That's why he calls himself their teacher and then their sender. But when Jesus is your teacher, he simultaneously, even without you knowing it perhaps, your sender as well. Sending you equipping you to preach to other people um, with or without a title. He goes on a bunch here. Let's just, uh, let's start closing up here. Let's see, uh, verse 19, uh, excuse me, verse 20. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who receives whomever I send, again, receives me, and he who receives me uh, receives him who sent me. Again, calling his disciples those that he was sending. And again, that's why, uh, that's why he did that, because that's what teaching is. Um, yeah, I, uh, I, have, I, have, I had a couple examples for you, too, um, but I, I think we're, we're, we're mostly good right there. Um, I hope everybody understood that, the concept of sending, because it's a really, really important thing, and I just shared with you a few verses on it, but really meditating on that really uh, will make a difference in your mind. Um, so I am done right now, but... The example that, I'll just leave you with this, the example that comes to mind, a couple examples. One, Jesus um, prepared, even as far as leadership roles were concerned, and actual like ministries, public ministries and stuff were concerned. Jesus prepared for what people estimate to about, be about 30 years before he uh, uh, went forward in, in like a public ministry for three years, right? You can see how important the sending process is, right? You can see how important you can see the importance that God puts on the sending process, the you getting your feet washed process, the mind renewal, because Jesus did grow in wisdom, the mind renewal process. You see the importance God places on that when he has someone, Jesus, who prepare for 30 years for a three-year ministry. Now, again, Jesus was speaking the truth all the way up until then, but before a public ministry, you can see what God values and sees as the most important thing is you getting your mind renewed. John the Baptist, same thing. Very long preparation for just a short ministry. Last example I'll give you, Moses. Moses was 40 years old about when he left Egypt, which he knew the Lord before then. So I don't know how long before that uh, he was getting to know the Lord. So some portion of that first 40 years, then went into the wilderness for another 40 years, getting to know Jesus that entire time during that 40 years in the wilderness in Midian. Then came back to Egypt at 80 years old to lead the people out of Egypt and be the leader of the people of Israel after 80 years and served as the leader and minister to the people for the next 40. Uh, and he, he died at 120 years old, right? Um, 80 years, give or take, at the very least 40 solid years, and then a portion of the first 40, getting to know the Lord for himself, 
to minister the last 40 in a public sort of position. You can see how God, the importance God places on beautiful feet before giving people a leadership role. And it's because he knows. God knows that you need to hear the word for yourself before you can preach something to, other, to, to someone else. And that's why God, even before a leadership role, and again, you can teach the gospel apart from a leadership role, but you can certainly see the weight that God puts on that sending process, that teaching process for yourself before even giving someone uh, or throwing someone else uh, you know, out into the spotlight to preach to, to other people in a public sort of way. Um, my point with all this is get your feet washed. It's the best thing you can do for somebody else. It prepares you and it sends you to effectively minister the gospel to anyone else uh, that you need to minister to, right? Just get your feet washed and listen to the word of God yourself. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reform Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this uncommon truth out to the world. If you'd like to support this good news, you can do so at reformchurch.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reformchurch.com.